Before I forget, I'd like to recommend that you read two chapters in the Infinite Way books. The subject of understanding the body is discussed in the title in that chapter of that name in uh, the 1957 letters. Understanding the body. It's a subject that we can't really conclude today. We'll have to continue next time because the subject is much too big. Probably it can't be encompassed in any series at all. That's 57 letters, Understanding the Body. And then you'll find in parenthesis, chapter 6, God the Consciousness of the Individual. dovetails with understanding the body and you begin to see more clearly what this letter to the angel of the church at Pergamos is about. I was awakened one night and this is what was given to me. God has created a perfect universe of his substance governed by his law in eternal perfection. Every divine idea is manifest within the one infinite spiritual substance and undivided from every other divine idea depending for its eternal perfection on its oneness in and through every other idea. Every idea maintains every other idea. This integrated one is the sum of its indivisible parts. If there were one idea in spirit that weren't there, the rest would collapse. You see, everything is interrelated And every idea is through every other idea. It's as if idea one is also in idea two and three. And idea two is also in idea one and three. And three is also in one and two. But take five billion trillion ideas and the same relationship exists. This was the meaning of that. I read it to someone who said, that's what Einstein said, that you remove a blade of grass and the whole world changes. The whole relationship changes. He said it about physical things. It is true about physical things because it is true about the spirit. You will see that because of the interrelationship of the spiritual idea within itself, this must externalize as man dependent upon man. Animal dependent upon animal. Man dependent upon nature. Animal dependent upon nature. We are all interrelated out here because we are interrelated in the spirit. And when we break that interrelationship, we are violating the fact of spirit. You cannot without paying the price. We cannot stop loving our neighbor without paying the price. We cannot see differences where only one is. And then this message came forth further as follows. The finite human senses are remote effects of this infinite activity and are totally incapable of reporting the wholeness like an ant would be in reporting a human event. To rely on the five senses to report anything accurately about infinity is suicide. Yet man does so. Science, unaware of infinite life, does so today. Religion, unaware of infinite life, believes that our human deficiencies are divine punishment. Little realizing that these human deficiencies are simply the inability of sense perception to report the fullness of reality. And finally, disregarding finite sense testimony 
we learn to depend instead upon the divine consciousness which governs its perfect universe to identify itself through our silence of the senses. Now right here in this third letter, the very next sentence is a very interesting one. Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now that slaying of Antipas, Antipas representing now the five sense mind which would slay the Christ, it was slain among us where Satan dwelleth. The five sense mind was slain when the Christ appearing to human sense in the form of Jesus was not overcome by the five sense mind. It was the five sense mind that was crucified that day, not Jesus. And that five sense mind crucifixion was made visible shortly thereafter by the death of Antipas. That which happened in spirit was that the Christ could not yield to the five sense mind and so the body of Jesus reappeared and the body of Antipas was murdered. One image shown to be eternal, the false image died. That was how Satan seat where the sense mind reposed was the place where the faithful martyr Antipas was slain among us. You see how everything is reversed to what the human sense sees? Now we have a few more things here which I think I can dispose of rather quickly. But I have a few things against thee, speaking again to divine consciousness in you. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Briefly, Balaam was a soothsayer of a tribe called the Midianites. And he was hired by the king of Moab named Balak. And the reason Balak needed the soothsayer Balaam was because on their trek out of Egypt the Israelites were now coming into the territory of Moab. And so he called Balaam and said, Say, I want you to curse these fellows and help me destroy them. And the symbolism is very clear. Now that Herod Antipas is gone, we've got the same thing all over again in Balak. The five sense mind, only now it's deceptive and it's afraid to fight the truth openly. And so it calls for help from Balaam. It wants his psychic power. And now you have a division. You have the divided consciousness exposed as Balak calling on Balaam to repel Israel, which is divine truth again. And Balaam would like to do that. He'd like to help Balak, but the voice intervenes. And it won't let him curse Israel. It makes him bless Israel. But although he cannot curse them, he still helps Balak and teaches him how to break down the purity of the Israelites by teaching them how to worship idols. And this is the stumbling block that is mentioned. In us is this Balak and Balaam, the five sense self, which is turning away from the Christ, Israel, and which seeks the help of, let's say, our rationalizing mind. And Balaam does this for a personal reward. For a personal reward, he teaches Balak to teach the Israelites how to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Now, the eating 
is not with the mouth. This is referring to the food of the mind. And the idols, therefore, are what we have just learned. The belief in the reality of matter is an idol. To believe that matter is real is a false idol. And that is what they are eating. Their belief that matter is reality and so they are questing matter. They are fornicating. They are mixing the purity of spirit with the belief that matter is also real. And so we're talking here about fornicating by mixed thoughts, letting the impurity of material belief, sense belief, five sense concepts enter the purity of spiritual form which is ever immaculate. And this is signified by they consorted with the women of Moab. This is how the Bible tells us that they were seeing matter where only spirit was. Now this Balaam incident then was from the Old Testament and referred to in this revelation of John and now I find that it was referred to in order to explain who the Nicolaitans were who follow. I had trouble with that as you know. Originally three years ago I thought the Nicolaitans mentioned here was some kind of a an alteration in the Bible because I knew of a Nicholas who was a Gnostic one who believed in the tenets of Christianity and I couldn't put the two together and so I figured some scribe somewhere had uh, secretly made an alteration or there had been a mistranslation and then I couldn't take the word hate which said God hates the Nicolaitans which follows but now I discover something sort of overpowering Balaam the soothsayer is indicated as unpleasing to the spirit and then so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which thing I hate now the Nicolaitans brings it into the contemporary world of that day the Balaam incident was the Old Testament but there were those Nicolaitans present in the time of this revelation and to my astonishment I discover that this is the priesthood and represents the bigotry of the priesthood of that day. First Balaam who for personal reward would teach Balak how to turn away from the pure wisdom of divinity and to linger in the five sense mind and now the priesthood taking the word of religion and making a formula out of it is equally unacceptable to the spirit you see the Nicolaitans have not been properly identified again by anyone anywhere for this reason the Nicolaitans are the symbol of all religious belief all belief that comes externally from the sense mind and not from inner inspiration when it is in the human lay mind is called the beliefs the doctrine of Balaam and when it is in the church mind it's called the doctrine of the Nicolaitans what it's called today you may use your imagination to discover but there are the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans all around you in every form of mental endeavor now then we are being told that neither the lay mind nor the church mind is capable of knowing the will of God the truth of God repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth we know that double-edged sword we discussed that and the repent then is to come out of the false human consciousness of the five senses which knows so much about nothing
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To have an ear means do something. Change consciousness. Yield a false consciousness to the truth. To him that overcometh, to him that does change consciousness from the five senses, will I give to heed of eat of the hidden manna, Instead of eating of that which is sacrificed unto idols, we eat of the hidden manna. The hidden manna then is identified as real substance. The substance of life itself. The bread of life. Whereas up to now, in the five senses, man eats by bread alone and not the bread of life. Now these secrets hidden from the five sense mind, the hidden manna, the real substance of life is given to those who overcome the belief in the five senses and what they are picture. And not only the hidden manna is given to those who overcome, but I will give them a white stone. And in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving him that receiveth it. The white stone has been identified as pure truth. Which leads to the realization of your pure soul body. Your body of spirit is the white stone. And in it a new name written. You know the name. But no, na no man knoweth it except him that receiveth it. Now you've heard the breath of God spoken of many times. And that breath of God is the inner revelation that comes. The inner inspiration. The inner guidance. And you cannot receive the hidden manna the realization of the spiritual body, the white stone, the pure truth, the new name of Christ, without inner inspiration. And that's why no man knoweth it except he that receiveth it. It's merely conversation until from within is given the word made flesh. Then we are past theories when we are out of the five sense mind and have overcome the tendency of that five sense mind to identify evil in the spiritual universe which is perfect then we are brought to a level where we do not speak of Christ we do not theorize, we do not discuss. We are in the experience of true selfhood, which no man knoweth except him that receiveth it. That experience of true selfhood is divine consciousness realized. When the individual consciousness of you and the infinite consciousness of the Father are one and you can truthfully say I know that I and the Father are one because one consciousness Christ functioneth my life now right now you will say you are conscious now let's give God the same privilege and I accept the fact that if I am conscious Certainly God is conscious. And so I am conscious here. God is conscious here. But God is infinite, so God is conscious everywhere. We can go that far. Everywhere God is conscious. And finally God is consciousness everywhere. And because God is consciousness everywhere... 
The perfection of God must be in that consciousness everywhere. That consciousness is embracing its universe. Its spiritual ideas in its consciousness are protected by that consciousness. And there are no others. And therefore those spiritual ideas in the consciousness of God are manifesting in the consciousness of God as pure spiritual manifestation, the invisible kingdom of God. Intact under perpetuity protected by the one all-embracing infinite consciousness and that is your assurance that because the omnipresent consciousness is ever functioning perfection must be where that consciousness is it is here and therefore perfection is here the consciousness of God is there and therefore perfection is there Wherever the consciousness of God is, perfection is. And the consciousness of God is everywhere. And you come to the realization that perfection must be everywhere because if perfection isn't everywhere, God isn't everywhere. If perfection isn't everywhere, then the consciousness of God isn't everywhere. Perfection must be right where you are at all times because the consciousness of God is there. Perfection must be right by the cross because the consciousness of God is there. Perfection must be right in the war zone because the consciousness of God is there. And you learn that when you accept imperfection, you are saying that the consciousness of God is not there. And your belief doesn't change the fact that the consciousness of God is there. It makes not a particle of difference what you believe. The consciousness of God is there. The sun may not be shining at this moment, but it's there. And you can declare all you want that the sun isn't in the sky. You're wrong. Your declaration doesn't change the fact. The fact is that the sun is in the sky. The fact is that the consciousness of God is ever-present. And the fact is that where the consciousness of God is, perfection is. And therefore the fact is that perfection is now everywhere throughout the universe. You cannot take it away. You can deny it. You cannot see it. It makes no difference. It is there. And do you see that your acceptance of it is the rejection of Balak and Balaam and the rejection of the Nicolaitans and the rejection of Herod and the rejection of Herod Antipas and the rejection of the evidence of the five sense mind. Your acceptance that perfection must be here, must be there because God is here and God is there is all you need to know, ever. You can sit with that, know it, relax in it and forget every image that comes your way in the knowledge that the image doesn't change the fact that God is present. Perfection is present. And I don't have to make it so. I merely have to dwell in the realization that it is the finished kingdom of God on earth now. Ever has been, even at the time of the alleged crucifixion, even at the time of every so-called world war, perfection has been the fact on this earth. You must witness that in your consciousness. And just as imperfection shows forth in our lives because our consciousness is still in that childish state which cannot be one with the infinite, as you accept this in consciousness, becoming one with the infinite, then the truth outpictures just as easily as the lie had outpictured. The thought externalizes as divine thought externalized. The great message of the activity of Jesus on earth is revealed as one who discovered himself to be pure spirit even as early as the age of 12 
And from then on, living not in the five senses was about his father's business. In a spiritual body which he called the light. And looking not at the world through five senses, he saw that perfection which is omnipresent and appeared as the healing of those who came to him. His consciousness, not in five senses, externalized as the healing, the visible manifestation of the word, of the perfection that is omnipresent now. And your acceptance of the reality of your being, the ability not to demand perfection or to seek perfection, but to accept it as the natural dispensation of spiritual identity, as the only reality on this earth, and not to go out seeking it or to make it so or to find it or to ask and knock for it, but to accept my name. Christ within, the Father within is my name. That is your name. And when you accept my name as your name, you are accepting that God is your Father. That Spirit is your substance. Spirit is your source. Spirit is your law. You are accepting that all that the Spirit has, I have. The consciousness of spirit is the consciousness of you. And the five sense consciousness, the second consciousness, the false sense of consciousness is slain as Antipas was slain by your realization of the truth of your being. Every time you accept an imperfection, right where that imperfection is, you have stated God is not there. You know you're wrong. God is there. And God cannot be there and the imperfection. Why do we make this ridiculous declaration then? Because we live in a five sense mind which makes it for us independent of our will, controlling us. But as we control the five sense mind, we can look at every form of imperfection knowing it is a total illusion of the senses. Its presence there, if it were real, would be a banishment of God. God cannot be there and that error too. Now let's turn it around. Let's get out of our negatives. Let's see the truth of being is that perfection is the natural condition of the presence of God. And once you have accepted the presence of God as everywhere, you cannot turn around and find imperfection where that presence is. It's inconsistent. Once omnipresence of God is the law of your being and you accept it, then the omnipresence of perfection is automatic. And you accept it. Then what would you do when the opposite appears? you recognize it as a five sense image a lie about the presence of God just as if somebody said to you the sun isn't in the sky anymore what would you do about it? nothing you know the truth the sun is in the sky and the same with the imperfection it is now coming to you and saying the sun isn't in the sky God isn't here but God is and only God is and it is the ability to stand there and rest in the knowledge that God is. Perfection is. Until the joy begins to well up from deep within you because when you know that God is and perfection is and consciousness is, oh, then I am that perfection. Every defect I think I have is a misperception of the senses. God is right here. Perfection is right here. I am looking through a five sense mind. But the fact 
does not change. If I can only be still to that five sense mind, I am being faithful unto the Father. And then I see why I've been told, abide in me. Acknowledge me. I'm not in those five sense images. I am the perfection of all being. And I am here and I am now. And I am there and I am now. And I am always here and there. And I am always now. Firm up that consciousness to the realization that this is the fact of being. And let the unreality come to a consciousness that no longer yields to the five senses and their untrue testimony. Then we have caught the meaning of the third letter to the angel of the church at Pagamos. The awakening of Christ in you to your consciousness of the divine consciousness which is your only consciousness. And anything in you which accepts perfection is a false state of consciousness which has no real existence. That false state of consciousness which accepts any imperfection is the substance of the imperfection. It isn't the imperfection that is there. It is your false consciousness made visible, made into a tangible experience. Overcoming that false consciousness by knowing the truth. That perfection is always present no matter what appears. Is the beginning of your fourth dimensional consciousness. And that's why this is the third letter leading to the fourth. Leading to the fourth dimension of consciousness. Where reality is experienced and understood. Now don't crucify yourself any more than we think the world crucified Jesus. To die daily to the five senses is all that ever dying daily meant. And you have two ways to die. You have a choice. You can die the natural way, the way people die. Or you can die by a transformation of consciousness. That's the meaning of, let those who have an ear hear these words. The transformation of consciousness is the way to die. <clears throat> and in that transformation you die to that which is unreal. You die to the belief that an image is a reality. You die to the belief that a spiritual universe has physical bodies. You die to the belief that a spiritual universe has physical conditions. And there's one mistake you don't make. And that's the mistake of saying and believing that I will accept this when it's proven to me. Because you'll be a long time in accepting. Nobody's going to prove to you that perfection is all that there is. If you haven't learned that through the New Testament and tried to find out for yourself, nobody's going to come up and prove it to you. Nobody can do a better job than has been done already. The proof is already established. Perfection is all there is. And if you want to experience that perfection, you will have to take the step of accepting that it is here. Not until you accept that it is here will you experience it. That was the meaning of to them that hath will be given. To he that hath accepted perfection as ever present will be given that perfection. To him that hath not accepted that perfection as present will be taken away the little that he has. When we were told to build treasures in heaven that the flesh profiteth nothing 
that we should sow to the spirit not to the flesh that all flesh is grass we were being told that the human form is an image in mind that matter is an image in mind and that if you go forth with the sole purpose of thinking that God has created this world for your pleasure that you may accumulate the material possessions of this world you find you are going contrary to the wisdom of the Christ which says there's nothing you need accumulate or seek all that the Father hath is already your own complete infinite being accept it let it flow and let the many mansions of spirit reveal themselves to you not through the five sense channel of ignorance but through the silence of that channel which opens the floodgates of the soul you will discover that mortality and materiality are the myths of the five sense mind you will notice the harmony that dissolves all of the imperfections that we had been willing to accept in our ignorance of the presence of God now that's a fairly th simple thing to follow perfection is because God is perfection is here because God's consciousness is here accept it in your mind alone and you'll find you wake up in the morning and the water of time will come over the shoreline of your mind and banish it like footprints in the sand but dwell with it quietly in the consciousness so that it becomes so deeply embedded that no mental ideas can erase it and always it will well up perfection is here now whatever you're looking at does not change that eternal fact you will learn to accept people in a different way I Christ thou Christ perfection is here now you cannot rob me I cannot rob you it is impossible perfection is here now the fact will not change the biggest swindle in the world won't change the fact that perfection is here the swindle is the five cent solution there's no thief on the cross because there's no material substance there's no Jesus crucified because only the Christ is there there's no executioner because only the spirit is there perfection is omnipresent because God is omnipresent that's our divine law and it will take us out of the wilderness practice it and you'll see you will feel and know that perfection as we move now into the fourth letter that will be next week we're out of the five sense mind which brings imperfections to our attention we're in the practicing of the presence of his consciousness everywhere and the attendant fact that perfection must be everywhere too and so we are not living in the five sense evidence we are living in the acceptance of his perfect presence everywhere as the abiding law we're in a new kind of faith an active faith a living faith and this is the formation of the new consciousness the rebirth by the acceptance of things unseen Paul had a name for it this inner tabernacle not made with hands we are accepting this kingdom not made with hands 
The miracle of divine presence everywhere is the fact that we never deny. We're discovering that we truly are sons of God. Thank you all very much. Hope to see you soon.